Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. It is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA, and what a privilege today uh, to be introducing uh, Rochelle Walensky. Uh, Rochelle, I'm not quite sure how to introduce you because I, I, you could be in Never Never Land. You, <laughs> you were uh, or are a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and you were chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Mass General. But sometime tomorrow, I think you told me 1202, you will become director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So welcome. Uh, are you in Never Never Land? Uh, wh wh <laughs> when does uh, your formal position start? Thank you so much. Um, it's such a gift to be back, and so thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I think you're you're sort of talking about the snowman's land the way I'm feeling it. Um, certainly, I will say tomorrow I will. I have every plan to be the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and what a privilege and honor that will be for me. Um, right now, I'm, I'm just working really hard, <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure who gets to claim me, but what I will say is I've been doing a lot of the work of the um, trying to get up to speed and making sure that we're hitting the ground running starting tomorrow. So on behalf of JAMA, and I think much of American medicine, one, congratulations, and I, I don't think... Um, we could have been blessed uh, with a, a more effective, what I hope will be effective and true leader of the CDC. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So let's take it in a series of challenges. Um, challenges for the CDC. Oh, wow. Um, so there's, um, there are, you know, how, how do I start? So the, there are challenges that I think we can sort of look internal facing and say, like, how is it that I make sure that the people who are there, these incredible scientists, um, these incredible civil servants for their entire career, understand and feel the value that we should be giving them? Um, they have been diminished. I think they've been muzzled. That science hasn't been heard. This top tier agency, world renowned, hasn't really been appreciated over the last four years and really markedly over the last year. So I have to fix that. Um, the good news in my mind is there hasn't been a mass exodus of the talent. The talent is still there. And so really what I need to do is um, is make sure that those voices get heard again, that I'm leading with trust, that the science is actually conveyed, that people understand that their science is appreciated, that it's not just the good news you're going to hear because sometimes the science is going to deliver bad news. So I, that I, ha I have to fix immediately. I have to make sure that we're communicating to the American people. So there's ex there's internal communication that I think we need to fix. There's external communication. Um, I've done numerous, uh, you know, media appearances where I've heard people say, you know, this is the first time we've heard from the CDC director in a year on this show. So I want to be able to to convey in layman's terms what the science shows, when guidelines change, when MMWRs are released, and what that science shows, um, and not just me, but subject matter experts who can convey that. Um, we need to do something about equity in this country. Um, and I think in the, the CDC is very much devoted to that. I am personally devoted to that. I know the president elect is devoted to that. So we need to convey that. We obviously need to get this country out of COVID and the current pandemic crisis that we are in. Tomorrow will be the um, one year anniversary from the first case in the United States. Um, likely today we will have hit 400,000 yeah. deaths. Um, so like it was pretty stark. I, I remember what I did last MLK weekend. Um, and, and it was it's interesting to think about where I was a year ago. I went out to dinner. I went to Symphony Hall in Boston. I heard the Boston Children's Chorus sing in a in a um, in a concert on on social justice. And so when I think about what that what the past year has been like, it's just strikingly different. Um, so we need to we need to fix COVID for sure. We need to, um, you know, part of the challenge with COVID was that we had a frail public health infrastructure to start. 
it just wasn't in good it wasn't ready to tackle what it was given um and then it was given more than it you know otherwise could have could have perceived could have you know done so so we need to fix that public health interest infrastructure and we need resources to do it so one of my challenges is just going to make sh- make sure that congress knows and understands that um that you know we are in this because we had warnings from many many other public health scares in the last 20 years and we didn't fix our public health infrastructure and our data infrastructure i have a lot of work ahead there's no question and then of course that is all on the backdrop of the fact that the cdc does a lot of work um, for our public health in times without crisis without pandemics um and that you know we're going to see a lot of collateral damage from the last year in terms of um hard won gains that have been lost child vaccinations and um and hypertension control hiv control um mental health challenges climate change impact on health so we've just had a lot of collateral damage in the last four years in the last year it's interesting because i always thought two of the great gifts quiet gifts that the united states gives to the world it's the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's, it's, it's striking. And the other is um, PubMed and the National Library of Medicine. I thought those were these two quiet gifts that, that we, we give to the world. What do you think your own challenges will be? Um, you're, you're going from a, a division of uh, 75 or 100 people to a federal agency of just over 10,000 people. What? How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons that I was chosen is probably because I'm new to the space. I'm new to the agency, right? So that cuts both ways. Um, every when people write about me as the selection for this position, they will say, "But she has no public health uh, pub, on the ground public health experience." True. I mean, all of these things are true. So, so I will have all of the benefit of coming in from the outside and being able to look in and say, this feels really broken or on the end user of that guidance, which I was for a year during a pandemic, we couldn't make that work. So I, I do have that, which I think will be extraordinarily helpful. The flip side is I don't have this robust institutional knowledge of the place. Um, I don't have, I, you know, how do you get something done. And so I'm going to rely on the people who've been there for their careers, um, who've done a really remarkable job and to help me navigate that. Um, So much of what I think is so valuable in medicine and in public health is connections and communication. Um, One of the things that's been so hard for me during this transition period is my lack of ability to actually just talk to the people at the CDC because you go through this um, agency review and and you can't speak to the current people there. And so I'm really looking forward to just bolstering communication. So I need to make a lot of connections with a lot of people. I need to make connections within the agency, the center directors, the people of the CDC. I need to make connections across the country with public health officials, with um, state labs, with epidemiologists, with um, the cities and the localities and the tribes and the territories. I need to make those connections. And then I need to make connections in Congress to make sure that we can get the resources that we need. And so um, I'm going to be doing a lot of networking. Certainly, I need to understand the science and move the strategies and and COVID, um, you know, forward, um, but I need to make those connections in order to make it happen. Uh, Rochelle, I've, I always thought that the, the CDC's done a wonderful job communi- communicating in traditional media, okay? That you have MMWR, and we've talked about this. You have newspapers, you have print, but that's not modern communication. J- JAMA has well over a million followers in social media. And they have access to all of our content through social media, through through links. Um, do, do you think the type of communication that the CDC has done in the past needs to change or to be upgraded or to be broader and wider? I'm just curious about what your concept is about communication in a very different space. Absolutely. And I've already had conversations about this. Um, MMWR, I don't think, is going away. I don't think JAMA or New England Journal are going away, right? I, that, like the, the print the, the, is not going away, and the signs conveyed in that way is not going away. Um, 
I can do television appearances, I can do interviews, we can do media briefings. Um, but but science is now conveyed through Twitter. Science is conveyed on social media, on podcasts, and in many different ways. And I think that's critical. I've already talked to the communications team, asking them, who's the social media person at right. the CDC? And I think the reason that that is so very important is because as we talk about vaccine hesitancy, or as we talk about anti-vaxxers, What's the CDC saying on Twitter about that? Um, because if you look up, you know, if you search vaccine hesitancy on Twitter and you don't see mostly the people who are hesitant and not the scientific community and the response to that hesitancy, um, there's just this massive void and the right information I think is not getting out there. So yes, that is, I've already, my, my first conversation about communications at the CDC was, I want you all to be able to speak. I want to make sure that the science is conveyed. We have to say it to one another. We have to say it to the public. And then we have to say it in other forms. We have to have a social media plan for the agency. I, I know for the last two weeks, you've really been working on preparing, moving from uh, Boston to Atlanta and, and taking, uh, b being responsible for this remarkable organization. There are some vaccine questions, um, but if you feel like you want to pass on them, you should pass on them. But I, I feel I feel like the, you're the head of, you're you're the head of the CDC to be in in 24 25 hours. So I I feel like I should ask. Uh, when will we know how strong a foothold the South African variant uh, has in the U.S. and will current vaccines address the specific variant? I don't think it's just the variant in South Africa, but also uh, obviously what's become known as the UK variant. Any comments about these variants and vaccines? Um, the first comment I'm going to say is I'm going to call them by their numbers and not by their country, because okay. I think um, stigmatizing we should not the country that they're coming from. Okay. The second thing I will say is um, part of the challenge of recognizing these variants is a lack of public health laboratory infrastructure in order to do the surveillance. Part of the president-elect's budget is to bolster that dramatically. And so I'm really, and and the work is already being done to create those connections with industry and academia and public health labs to make sure we have a really good influx and we can follow these variants across the country. Those that may be coming um, initially from countries abroad and those that, you know, might be emanating from our own country. I think with the regard to the variants, we worry about about four things in my mind. We worry about increased transmissibility, mm -hmm. and we've seen that with some of them. Um, we worry about um, increased morbidity and mortality. We haven't yet seen that, um, although I think we should worry about it because with more disease and more cases, right. we're going to have more for transmissibility, more morbidity and mortality. And then how well and how robust these, um, these variants are our vaccines and our therapies are in tackling them when they arise. Um, and I know, you know, it's not, in, we will probably be doing most of the detection and the surveillance at the CDC level. And then I think a lot of the science, although some will happen at the CDC too, as to the impact on vaccines and, and treatments will happen in other spaces. Um, we are data are already starting to emerge. I, I think the good news with regard to the variants er, is that we had um, the efficacy of the vaccine is so good and and so high that we have a little bit of a cushion so that even if the la in the lab some of these variants don't have as they don't appear as robust as the um, as the initial strain that we'll probably still end up with quite a good vaccine. Um, and, and I just want to remind people like almost no vaccine we have is 95% right. effective. So um, before we panic, I, you know, and say, well, should I really get the vaccine if the variant isn't going to, if it's not going to work against the variant, it's going to work against the variant. Um, and, you know, will it be 95%? Maybe. Will it be 70%? Maybe, um, but you know our flu vaccines aren't seventy percent effective every year, and we still get them. So, so I'm really optimistic about how these variants are going to go. I could be wrong. It could be that we'll we'll find variants, and variants may emerge that have less, um, you know, our uh, where the vaccine is less potent. But I'm still currently pretty optimistic. Um, there's there's more uh, questions, obviously. You know, p part of the struggle, clearly, the last two or three months is is knowing how many people have been vaccinated, how how many vaccines, immunizations have actually been delivered to the states, how many are in the warehouse. 
getting them from the warehouses, people say, into people's arms uh, has been a real struggle. President-elect Biden, soon to be President Biden, has, uh, has um, uh, talked about three or four very specific ideas about trying to increase the number of individuals who are vaccinated. I hope he's right about 100 million uh, uh, doses vaccinated individuals in 100 days. Some of that will depend on supply, which I think people really need to understand. We don't know if there'll be 100 million doses delivered from either Pfizer or Moderna. What do you think the keys are for just the next month, Rochelle? So, um, I don't think the president-elect would have uh, suggested 100 million doses in 100 for the next 100 days if um, he and his team and we didn't have a vision that we'd have that supply. So right. um, I think certainly we have to worry about supply as one of the many constraints. I think of this as a multiple constraint problem. Right? What are going to be all the constraints? So we have to worry about the eligibility. Um, in some places, it's been too tight and people can't get vaccine when they seem to be eligible. In some places, it's been way too loose and that you have all these people who are eligible and then massive queues. Um, so we have to titrate our supply and our on our eligibility so that we somehow hit the sweet spot wherever it is we are with how much supply we have and how many people are eligible. And there's been a lot of work to make sure that we're following the CDC guidance, but not in the ASIP guidance, but not too strictly that we're, we're too many people are being held back and there's doses on the shelf. So there's the people, there's also the vaccinators. We need to make sure that there are enough people out there who can vaccinate, um, especially when our public health system and our medical system is running pretty, you know, 24 seven these days. So can we look to retirees? Can we look to the public, public health commission corps, medical military? Can we look at um, retired folks? Can we look at at, um, at medical students, nursing students, you know, upper level students who could vaccinate. Um, we're looking at dentists and vac veterinarians, mm -hmm. of, you know, a huge workforce of people to be able to vaccinate. And then the question is place. Where is it that people are going to go to get their vaccine? And I think um, there are four prongs to this that the president-elect and the team is working on. One is community vaccination centers, be it stadiums, gymnasiums, things like that. Another is mobile units, making sure we can do the outreach to get to those communities who otherwise wouldn't be reached. Another is for federally qualified health centers. Um, some of that is happening, but not um, as much as could be happening across the state. And then finally, a pharmacy program, working closely with the states and the pharmacies to make sure we can do outreach at the pharmacy level. And the vision of that sort of four-pronged approach to places is really founded in equity. We want to make sure that we can deliver volume, but also volume to the people in places that, that might be harder to reach. And then this collaboration at the federal level to make sure that with the entire um, support and resources available at the federal level to work with states to say, what do they need for help? in order to do that distribution. I um, th think the comments about delivery are so critical. As, as you know, I, I did most of my medical career in Boston that has community health centers that are very linked to the community. And many of those community health centers in Boston and around the country, of which there's thousands, are really in uh, areas in, in, in that have been the hardest hit by COVID-19 in terms of black communities, Latinx communities. So it really makes sense to prioritize, prioritize delivery through those community health centers. And you know, I've jokingly talked about the ice cream truck going around to reach hard to reach communities. It's striking to me that the rural areas, the rural states have actually done better than the, than the urban states or the more urbanized states. There's gotta be a lesson there somehow that they have figured out more creative ways to reach individuals. Yeah, right. Especially since density doesn't help. I mean, density helps them on a on a transmission standpoint, right. but it doesn't help them on a vaccine distribution standpoint. Yeah, you're absolutely right. West Virginia doing remarkably well. And what I want to say, you know, you look at Cardinal Stadium, Dodger Stadium, you, you see the like what is possible. So the federal government is not going to need to go into Phoenix and say, do you need help with your Cardinal Stadium? Right. They've done a great job. So the question is then what does Arizona need? Do they need mobile clinics? Do they need more collaboration with the pharmacies? And so I think the real vision is that the federal government will step in at a state by state level and say, what is it, the help that you need? Um, you've done a remarkable job in rolling out X, but we need help in rolling out Y. So, so how can we be helpful? 
Um, one other question, and then I'll have a final question. I know your time is limited. Um, there's been some discussion uh, about monoclonal antibodies, particularly. Uh, the data on convalescent plasma is still really quite confusing. Some positive trials, some less positive trials. I think convalescent plasma, because you don't know if you're giving it for prevention of serious disease or to people with serious disease, has become increasingly complicated. But, con but monoclonal antibodies have worked in the past and, and appear there's some good data about it, but it doesn't seem readily available. Do you have any idea? I mean, when you, when you were working at the General before you were in this transition, um, how available was monoclonal antibodies to, you know, the frail elderly who, you know, has mild or moderate disease and you're trying to prevent progress to serious disease? Um, you know, I think if you're well resourced and networked and you needed to get a monoclonal, I was just able to get some for a colleague in LA today. Um, but I know how to do that, right? And and so is this the answer to this pandemic? I worry that it's not. Is it the only thing we have as an outpatient? Yeah, it's, that's what we have. I think there are doses available, but part of that has been, it's so it's been so hard and clumsy to be able to implement. Um, there are some places that have been able to do it well, that have been able to give thousands of doses. Um, that I, in my mind, it feels like the exception and not the rule, um, or it feels like places that have resources. Um, and, and equity just really worries me there. Um, you know, at the same time that we're trying to have a an informed decision-making conversation with somebody who had a delayed diagnosis or a delay to, you know, harder to, to get a test back, you need to act quickly, maybe they don't have transportation, you need to bring an infected person, a highly mm. infected person into a medical center to do the infusion. All of those things are just hard. Um, and then we have this sort of over this sort of concern in the back of our heads that, you know, are they going to work on the variants if they are truly monoclonal? You know, if you have a cocktail, maybe that's a little bit better. But this doesn't feel like the um, it may be, you know, a step in the in the path to get us to a better place. But I don't think that anybody envisions that this is going to be the panacea for, for outpatient treatment. It's just too hard. So the last question, and it's more personal. What's this meant to your family? You have children, a mother and father. You <laughs> have a husband. We've talked about, uh, about this. It's an extraordinary appointment. Um, you, you probably didn't think this was going to happen six months or a year ago. <laughs> what, what's it mean to, to to you and your family? Um, that is so much. I, I'm the daughter of an army general um, who fought in World War, or the granddaughter of an army general who fought in World War II. So I, I do have service in my the course, you know, through my veins. Of course, it's through my veins. It's been a gift that my parents have been alive to see this and to see the reaction. Um, um, it has just been extraordinary. You know, my family recognizes the sacrifice that this is going to be. Um, and they felt it for the last, what has it been, six weeks? Um, they really understand. Um, and I sort of call it my mid-career uh, residency. <laughs> you know, I figure I'm going to go for several years, maybe a surgical rec residency. We'll see how long it lasts. But but um, I'm going to just dive in. And, uh, you know, um, I, I said it in my, my nomination. Um, I got called during a code. And when you get called during a code, your you, your job is to be there to help. And so um, I think my kids are really proud. I think they know that they're, you know, may not see as much of me. Um, and I think they know that and they understand that this is what I have to do. And um, I hope they take that with them and they know that um, I'm not uh, leaving them or caring any much, any less about them. And I will be there for them. Um, but this is what I have to do. I... Uh can't imagine the CDC in the country being luckier to have you been appointed to head the CDC, um, m mostly just because you can communicate, which is such an important task for the head of the CDC. And I, I think you know things that need to get better, and uh, I just imagine you'll be remarkably effective. And Thank you. So on behalf of JAM and the JAMA Network, I want to congratulate you um, and wish you Godspeed. Thank you so much. This is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. I've been chatting with 
the newly appointed director of the Centers for Disease and Control, uh, Rochelle Walensky. Thanks, Rochelle, and stay healthy and, and good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.